Welcome to Lesson 5e, Grade Lines. In this lesson, we define two grade lines, the energy grade line and the hydraulic grade line. We discuss applications of these grade lines and how they relate to the energy equation and how irreversible head losses affect these grade lines. And we'll do some example problems. Consider first the hydraulic grade line, or HGL. By definition, HGL is the height to which a liquid rises from a pressure tap normal to the flow, which we also call a static pressure tap. I'll illustrate with the diagram. Suppose we have flow through a pipe from left to right. If I drill a small hole through this pipe and the pressure in the pipe is greater than the local atmospheric pressure, the liquid will shoot out of the hole. By the way, we're assuming we have a liquid inside this pipe. Instead, we attach a hollow tube to the hole we call that a piezometer, and the liquid will rise to some column height depending on the pressure at this location. Since this is a static pressure tap, or a pressure tap normal to the flow, this elevation is the HGL, which we can measure relative to some arbitrary datum plane. Now let's add another hole, but this time let our tube protrude through the hole and then curve and point towards the flow. This will give us an energy grade line, or EGL, which is the height to which a liquid rises from a total pressure probe aligned parallel to and facing into the flow, which is what we have here. This is also called a total pressure probe, or a stagnation pressure probe. The pressure here will be higher than the pressure here, because this feels the full impact of the flow hitting it, whereas here the flow is just passing by. Again, the water will rise in this tube, but now to some higher elevation. And this is what we call the EGL, relative to the same datum plane. Mathematically, it turns out that the hydraulic grade line is P over rho G plus Z, where Z is also measured from that same datum plane. In other words, Z equals zero at the datum plane. In pipe flows like this, the pressure here is the pressure here plus the hydrostatic head pressure. But that hydrostatic pressure does not affect this HGL. So you can think of the HGL as acting at this point as well as the EGL. The EGL is P over rho G plus V squared over 2G, where V is the speed hitting that probe, plus the same Z. Comparing these two equations, we see that EGL minus HGL equal V squared over 2G, so we can solve for this speed in the pipe, namely V equal the square root of the quantity 2G times EGL minus HGL. So this is a simple way to measure speed in a pipe. In all my examples, I'm assuming that this total pressure probe is in the center of the pipe, but you could actually move it up and down to get the speed at different locations. Now let's do an example. We have water flowing at 20 degrees C through a pipe. We have two static pressure taps or piezometers, and we have two total pressure probes at one and two. So we call these distances HGL1, EGL1, HGL2, and EGL2. We want to calculate the water speed at locations one and two in units of meters per second. I'll call those speeds U1 and U2. Using our above equation, U1 is the square root of 2G times EGL1 minus HGL1. We plug in the numbers 2G, 8.56 centimeters minus 6.85 centimeters, and then a unity conversion factor all under the square root. I get 0.57914 meters per second. To three digits then, U1 is 0.579 meters per second. We repeat at two using these two values instead of these two values, and we get the same answer. U2 is also 0.579 meters per second. That's because the difference between these two is the same as the difference between these two. Which brings us to part B of the question. Do you suspect that this flow is fully developed? Why or why not? Well, we'll talk about developing pipe flow in more detail later. But briefly, in a developing flow, the velocity profile is changing downstream, but by conservation of mass, the average velocity, v, must remain the same. And eventually, this profile no longer changes. So at some downstream location, we say that the flow is fully developed, whereas upstream of that point, it's still developing. Notice that the maximum velocity at the center line is increasing as we go downstream until we hit this fully developed flow. If this were location 1 and this were location 2, and we measure u1 and u2, they would be different. And we would have to conclude that this part of the flow is developing. But in our case, these two speeds are the same. So these are not the locations. Rather, the two locations are more likely here, where u1 equal u2, which is the maximum velocity at the center line. 
So my answer to the question is yes. And why? The velocity profile is most likely not changing, although we're only measuring one point, the centerline point at each of these locations, and the flow is fully developed. Later on, we'll discuss how long this pipe has to be before the flow becomes fully developed. Next, I want to talk about the relationship of EGL to the head form of the energy equation. Suppose we have some flow through a duct that is converging, something like this, with flow from left to right. Let me pick a control volume from inlet 1 to outlet 2. I choose a control volume that is a stream tube from location 1 to location 2. You can think of a stream tube as just a thick streamline. We have some average speed and some pressure at 1, and some average speed and pressure at 2. Since this is our control volume, we can write the energy equation between inlet and outlet 1 and 2 in head form. I'll write out the whole thing, but now we'll let the stream tube shrink to a stream line. In other words, it has no more thickness. Well, that means that we can't even calculate an alpha. In other words, alpha 1 and alpha 2 are 1. We have no pump in this control volume. We have no turbine. So we can rewrite the equation as just the remaining terms. So this equation holds along a streamline in any kind of a duct or pipe flow where there's no pumps or turbines. But this grouping of terms is EGL1. And this grouping is EGL2. And this term, as you recall, is the irreversible head losses. By the way, this grouping of terms can also be called the total head or the Bernoulli head in reference to the Bernoulli equation that we'll talk about in the next lesson. So this equation simplifies to EGL1 equal EGL2 plus HL along a streamline. We note that since HL is always greater than zero, EGL must continually decrease. In a flow like this, there will be some friction, and the EGL here will be greater than the EGL here. This is true no matter what kind of pipe or duct we have. The duct can be converging and diverging at various points, but along some streamline, you can be assured that EGL1 is greater than EGL2, which is in turn greater than EGL3. Let's do another example. It's really the same example from above. We've already done parts A and B, and now here's part C and D. Let's calculate the irreversible head loss in this pipe flow between locations 1 and 2. Well, we solve the equation we just derived for HL and plug in the numbers and the unity conversion factor to get this into meters as asked. So HL is 0.0122 meters. You can see that this is a way of actually measuring irreversible head loss through some kind of a pipe. And part D says to calculate the pressure loss in this pipe flow between these two locations. We recall for an equivalent column height of pressure, delta Z, delta P is rho G delta Z. Well, here we have two column heights of pressure, EGL1 and EGL2, and the head loss is the difference in those elevations. Therefore, the pressure loss from 1 to 2 is just rho GHL. So this pressure loss is the density of water at 20 degrees C, G, and HL, and then our usual unity conversion factors. And my final result is 119 pascals to three digits. Finally, I want to just do a qualitative example of grade lines in a variable area pipe flow. This figure is taken from our textbook. We have a large tank, and the water flows through by gravity. We've sketched the energy grade line up here, actually a curve, and the hydraulic grade line here, also a curve. And I typed up some comments here. At point zero, there's no flow. So if you look back at our equations, HGL and EGL are the same, since V is zero. If you stick a piezometer tube or total pressure probe in here, you would get no elevation rise at all, since there's no flow and the pressure is just atmospheric pressure. So the HGL and the EGL are the same at this point zero. As the flow accelerates, the speed increases, it turns out that the pressure decreases and HGL goes down. EGL, however, stays fairly constant but must decrease a little bit due to some irreversibilities at this inlet. As we go through this straight section of pipe, both HGL and EGL decay. Recall that the difference between EGL and HGL at any point is V squared over 2G. This is shown at point 1. Now we go through a diffuser. The HGL actually increases because the speed is going down to conserve mass. But the pressure increases and there are irreversibilities, so the EGL continues to drop. At this location, the speed is lower than it was here, so the difference between EGL and HGL is smaller than it was here. Now we have a developing pipe flow situation where both EGL and HGL 
drop rapidly at first and then drop linearly with distance since this is now fully developed finally at the exit since this is a jet exiting into the atmosphere hgl is once again the same elevation as the fluid since the pressure here is atmospheric just as it was up here the egl is still higher by this amount v2 squared over 2g since this stagnation pressure probe feels the full impact of the flow even at the exit plane note that egl continually falls this is due to irreversible losses HGL, on the other hand, can rise or fall. We see it falling and then rising and then falling again. Overall, however, it also falls. In fact, HGL can never rise above EGL since EGL has that extra velocity term. Hopefully this helps you understand that irreversibilities cause both EGL and HGL to fall as we go through this pipe system. HGL can temporarily rise, but it still has to fall overall. In fact, the only way that EGL can rise is if you add some energy to the fluid, for example, by a pump. In this case, the EGL will continuously fall and then get a boost from the pump and then continually fall again. HGL will also fall parallel to EGL, will rise through the pump, and then fall again. At any location, the difference between the EGL and the HGL is V squared over 2G. This is true both upstream and downstream of the pump. Let's call location 1 just upstream of the pump and location 2 just downstream of the pump. You can go back to our head form of the energy equation with the pump term and show that EGL2 equal EGL1 plus H pump U minus HL, which is the head loss between these two locations, not counting pump inefficiencies as per our convention. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.